Hi everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of my brand new series, Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, where as a lawyer, I will present to you the material facts of a case and the evidence that is required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime. Some of these cases have already resulted in a conviction, which means that the standard of proof has already been met by the prosecution. However, this fact alone does nothing to assuage the fans or supporters of some of these criminals who still seem to believe that their favorite criminal is innocent despite a finding of guilt by a jury and court. Perhaps one of the most notorious criminals with such a following is Jody Arias. And thus, we will start off the first episode of Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with looking at the facts of her case and the evidence in as efficient and concise a manner as possible. Jody Arias was 26 when she met 29-year-old Travis Alexander in September of 2006. They quickly formed a close attachment to each other, with Jody even converting to Travis's faith of Mormonism in November of 2006, and she was baptized by Travis himself. Soon after, they commenced a long-distance relationship in February of 2007 and ending in June of the same year. Jody lived in California at the time while Travis resided in Mesa, Arizona. According to Jody, she had broken up with Travis for breaching her trust. Despite the end of the romance, Jody moved to Mesa and lived close to Travis, and they continued to maintain a sexual relationship. However, eventually in April of 2008, Jody moved back to Wairika, California to live with her grandparents, citing financial difficulties. At this point, Travis had moved on and started to see other women. And soon after, strange occurrences had started to take place, such as the slashing of Travis's tires, random knocks on the windows and doors of Travis's house while he was in there with a woman that he was interested in called Lisa, and threatening emails emails that were sent anonymously to Lisa. Travis even told his friends that Jody had snuck into his house through the doggy door. When Travis confronted Jody about these things, she denied being behind any of them. Despite these incidents and the knowledge that Jody was in fact behind them, Travis continued to maintain contact with her. It is also worth mentioning that on the 28th of May of 2008, after Jody moved in with her grandparents, a burglary was reported to have taken place at her home and a 2.5 caliber pistol was reported stolen. Bear in mind this fact because it will become relevant when we discuss the evidence. On the 2nd of June of 2008, Jody rented a car and headed out on a road trip to Utah where she had arranged to meet a potential new flame by the name of Ryan Burns, who was also a devout Mormon. She first stopped by to visit an ex-boyfriend in California who lent her two gas cans at her request. When she resumed her road trip, she stopped by at a Walmart in Salt Lake City to purchase a third gas can. Again, hold on to this fact because we'll talk about it in much more detail when we discuss the evidence. However, before arriving at her destination of Utah, Jody decided to make a detour to, you guessed it, Mesa, Arizona. She arrived in the early hours of June 4th, 2008, where she was greeted by Travis. She then claims that they both fell asleep and woke up later in the day, after which they had sex throughout the afternoon and took pictures of their activities. Then, around 5.30 p.m., while Travis was in the shower, Jody started to take photographs of him. No one knows what exactly happened next to trigger Jody, who then started to stab Travis while he was standing there, naked and vulnerable in the shower, completely taken aback by her vicious and sudden attack. Jody stabbed Travis at least 27 times, one of which went straight through his heart. This alone was enough to kill him. However, that wasn't enough for Jody. She then proceeded to slit Travis's throat from ear to ear in a cut so deep, she almost decapitated him. Finally, in what was indeed a spectacular show of rage, she shot him in the face. She then stuffed Travis's body in the shower, proceeded to clean as much as she could, deleted the photos taken that day off the camera, and threw it in the washing machine along with a pile of laundry. According to the testimony of Ryan Burns, Jody arrived in Utah a day late. 
They spent the entire day together with considerable displays of affection, if you catch my drift. Not sex though, because they were both devout Mormons, let's not forget that. And Ryan states that Jody's demeanor was cheerful and nothing seemed amiss. The next day, Jody departed back to Wairika. Travis's badly decomposed body wasn't found until the 9th of June, five entire days after he was murdered. On the 10th of June, after she had been made aware of the discovery of Travis's body, Jody reached out to the police of her own accord in order to assist in any way that she can. She also made an appearance at Travis's memorial uninvited, even though by then, she was already aware that everyone was pointing the finger at her. People at the memorial stated that she was all smiles and appeared to be in an inappropriately cheerful mood. On July 9th, 2008, on Jody's 28th birthday, she was indicted by a grand jury in Maricopa County, Arizona for the first degree murder of Travis Alexander. She was later arrested on the 15th of July, 2008. When she was interrogated by the Mesa Police Department, Jody initially denied being anywhere near Mesa on the 4th of June of 2008, despite the overwhelming evidence that placed her there. Cornered by the detective, she first claimed that she got lost in the desert, which is why she was a day late to arriving in Utah. She then spun the infamous ninja story, where she claimed that two masked figures broke into Travis's house, murdered him, and miraculously let her flee. She stuck to this version of her story for quite a while, repeating it in the multiple interviews that she gave after her incarceration, including the most famous one of them all, the 48 hours interview, which was eventually used as evidence in her trial. All right, now for some legal analysis. In the law, every crime has certain elements that must be satisfied in order for the crime to have been committed. Jody was charged with first-degree murder. Let's have a quick look at the elements that are required to prove the commission of this crime. A person commits first-degree murder if intending or knowing that the person's conduct will cause death, so this is the intention element, the person causes the death of another person with premeditation. Let's have a look at these three separate elements and see whether they have been satisfied in this case. Firstly, intention. I don't have to argue that stabbing someone at least 27 times, almost decapitating them and shooting them in the face satisfy the intention element. So I'm just going to move on from this one onto the next. The second element has also been satisfied by the unfortunate and tragic death of Travis Alexander caused by Jody's conduct. And finally, premeditation. This means prior planning. I submit that the following evidence satisfy this element. Firstly, the staged burglary that took place on the 28th of May, 2008 in Jody's grandparents' home. A .25 caliber pistol was reported missing as a result of that burglary. A week later, Travis was shot with a 2.5 caliber pistol. This proves premeditation as it is now known that Jody most likely staged that burglary at her grandparents' home in order to cover up for the fact that she took that .25 caliber pistol to kill Travis a week later. Secondly, the gas cans. As I mentioned earlier, Jody first dropped by her ex-boyfriend's house to pick up two five gallon gas cans. She then purchased a third one from Walmart for a combined total of 15 gallons. The reasoning behind this is that she wanted to avoid having to stop at gas stations in or around Arizona so that there would be no record of her presence there, such as CCTV footage or receipts. This goes to show that she had always intended on going to Arizona incognito. If her intentions were truly innocent, she wouldn't have had to take such drastic measures to ensure that she stays off the radar so that no one could place her in Arizona around the time of the murder. Next is her hair color. For at least two years prior to the murder, Jody was a platinum blonde. She maintained that color up until the 2nd of June of 2008. We know this because the man who rented out the car to her, Rafael Colombo, identified her as a blonde. Therefore, we know that Jody dyed her hair brown at some point after renting out the car and embarking on her road trip. This evidence supports premeditation as it goes to show that she tried to change her appearance in order to minimize the chances of being recognized by any of Travis's neighbors who have regularly seen her as a blonde before. She also rented an inconspicuous 
car. Initially, Rafael Colombo offered Jody a red car, which she promptly declined. She specified that she was looking for something that wasn't so loud. She ended up opting for a white one instead. The reason being that white is such a common and easily blendable car that wouldn't stand out. On the topic of the rented car, Jody had a fully functioning car of her own, and yet she decided to travel 90 miles south of her hometown of Wairika to a place called Reading, which is where she rented her car from. Again, this shows the meticulous planning that she undertook in order to eliminate any links between her and Travis's murder. Next, we have the removal of the license plate off the rented car. At some point before Jody arrived at Travis's residence, she removed the car's back license plate. She presumably did this so that no one could identify the car and link her to it. We know that she did this because on June 5th, she was pulled over by a police officer in Utah for having an upside down license plate. According to the testimony of both Ryan Burns, who was present as a witness when this happened, and the police officer who pulled her up, she seemed genuinely taken aback by this. Ryan Burns and the officer also both testified that she laughed it off and claimed that it was just her friends playing games with her. When interrogated about this later, Jody claimed that a bunch of skater kids messed with her license plate while she was at a Starbucks on her way to Utah. As is common with Jody, her two stories did not line up, which point to the fact that she was lying. In all likelihood, she hastily put back the license plate after the murder in the dark, probably in a very rushed manner because she had just committed a heinous crime and didn't realize that she put it back upside down. Finally, the turned off phone. Jody's phone was turned off for 27 hours between June the 3rd and June the 5th. She only turned it on again when she was at the Arizona and Nevada border, which is around four hours away from Travis's home. Now her story to the police was that her phone died after she had lost her phone charger. Upon finding it under the passenger seat of her car, she was able to charge it and turn it on again. The story she gave Ryan Burns, however, was that she bought a new charger. So once again, her stories don't line up because liars never remember their lies. She turned off her phone in order to avoid being pinged by a cell tower in the Arizona area. Once she was a safe distance away from Travis's home, she turned it on again and left him a few frenzied and rushed voicemails in an attempt to pretend that she had no idea that he was dead. Immediately, almost immediately, when you say you come out of this fog, one of the first things that you do is you try to divert attention away from you so that the police won't think that you had anything to do with this killing, right? Yes. So these are being forwarded to voicemail then, right? Correct. And what's the time on this one? 11.37 p.m. on June 4th, 2008. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits. So fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. Um, also, we were talking about, <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way, I was looking at the May calendar, duh. So I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to co accompany us. Um, I don't know when Team Freedom's event is, though, but, you know, it's on the list, so we could do, um, we could do Shakespeare, Crater Lake, and the coast, so if you, make, if you can make it. If not, we'll just do the coast in uh, Crater Lake. But let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. End of message. That's you, correct? Correct. And that's you lying on the message, right? Yes. Despite her best efforts, her phone was actually picked up by a cell phone tower in Arizona. I'm going to briefly touch on the topic of motive because it is a very crucial factor when it comes to murder cases. To put it simply, Jody's motive was jealousy. She was jealous of the fact that Travis had moved on, she was jealous of the other women that he was courting, and she was angry about the fact that Travis couldn't commit to her. 
Friends and family routinely compare the dynamic of their relationship to that of the famous 1987 movie, Fatal Attraction. In a nutshell, as far as Jodie was concerned, if she couldn't have Travis, then no one could. The evidence will be submitted in order of its strength and compelability. Firstly, her DNA. Jodie's DNA was found all over the murder scene. Jody argued that she practically lived there for a time, which would explain the presence of her DNA there. However, there were two traces of DNA that irrefutably put her in the crime scene. First, her bloody palm print was found on the wall of Travis's hallway, and it was mixed with her blood and Travis's blood. And secondly, a strand of Jody's hair was found stuck with Travis's blood. Moreover, the hair follicle was still intact. Now, hair follicles usually fall off the hair strand after a short period of time, and so the presence of the follicle indicated that the hair was left there recently. Secondly, the photographs. It turns out that the camera that Jody tried so hard to destroy came out of the washing machine in relatively good shape. The memory card was recoverable at least, and forensic experts were able to recover the contents of the memory card and analyze three sets of photographs that were time and date stamped from the day of the murder. The first set of photos were the ones that Jody and Travis took of each other as they were having sex. They were dated the 4th of June 2008 and were time stamped earlier in the afternoon around the 1 p.m. mark. The second set are the ones that Jody took of Travis while he was in the shower. These were timestamped later on on the 4th of June, specifically around the 5.30 mark. The final set of photos were the ones that were clearly taken by accident during the course of the murder. The most damning ones were the two that were taken as Jody dragged Travis's bleeding body across the hallway and towards the bathroom. These were timestamped around the 5.32 p.m. mark. Thirdly, the gun. A shell from a bullet found at the crime scene corresponded to a .25 caliber pistol shell. Now, I've already touched upon the fact that a week before Travis was murdered, a .25 caliber pistol was reported as stolen from Jody's place of residence at the time. Unfortunately, the pistol itself was nowhere to be found. Jody presumably disposed of it somewhere in the desert between Arizona and Utah. The knife that was used in the murder wasn't able to be identified with certainty by forensic experts. So we don't know whether Jody came pre-armed with a knife or whether she used one from Travis's kitchen. Jody stated that she had a memory of putting a knife in the dishwasher. However, she claimed that her memory was hazy and that she couldn't distinguish whether this was a memory from before the murder, when she used to visit Travis regularly and clean his house, or whether it was after the murder. The kitchen and its utensils were cleaned multiple times by Travis's roommates during the days that elapsed between the murder and the day that his body was found. So presumably the knives in the kitchen were washed multiple times and so any traces of DNA were washed off. A quick note on the knife. Ryan Burns testified that upon arriving in Utah, Jody had cuts on her hands that she had covered up with band-aids. When he questioned her about it, she said it was a result of an accident while she was waitressing at her place of employment. However, during her interrogation, Detective Esteban Flores analyzed these injuries and recognized them as the classic cuts that people sustain when stabbing an individual and when the knife becomes covered in blood, which makes it slippery. And so the perpetrator's hand slips onto the blade, which causes these cuts. Jody even conceded in her trial that her left finger was permanently damaged in the course of the murder. Another piece of evidence that supports this is the fact that Jody is left-handed. In her interrogation, she also giggles and remarks on this fact. Therefore, her left ring finger was injured as opposed to her right because she was most likely using her left hand to stab Travis. By the time her trial commenced on the 2nd of January of 2013, Jody changed her story once again. She claimed self-defense. She spun the narrative of being the battered girlfriend who suffered at the hands of Travis until it hit a boiling point of kill or be killed. It is my belief that her legal team convinced her to change her story after the overwhelming amount of evidence that came to light. After the presentation of this evidence, along with the testimony of countless other witnesses and experts, the jury unanimously found Jody guilty of first-degree murder. 
As this was a capital case, Jody was eligible for the death penalty, but on two separate sentencing phases, the jury failed to unanimously hand down a death penalty, which means that Jody's life was spared. The court then sentenced her to life in prison without the possibility of parole on April 13th, 2015. In October of 2019, Jody launched an appeal, alleging gross misconduct on the part of the trial prosecutor, Juan Martinez. I've previously made a video covering this appeal, so if you haven't watched it, please make sure you do. I will link it down in the description box below, and it will also be recommended to you up here. In closing, I submit that the evidence presented in this case proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Jody Arias murdered Travis Alexander on the 4th of June of 2008 in a premeditated manner. To this very day, overzealous supporters and fans of Jody attack people such as myself for stating the fact that she is a convicted murderer. Notwithstanding the fact that she was unanimously convicted by a jury, these people still believe and insist on her innocence. Need I remind these people that Jody Arias herself confessed to killing Travis throughout the course of her trial, and most famously, in the statement that she read out to the court on the day of her sentencing in April of 2015. In that statement, she said that she remembers that Travis was still alive when she slit his throat and that she felt the knife go into him. She even argued about the sequence of events. For example, that she shot him before she slit his throat, which the medical examiner believes to be the other way around. Furthermore, she stated that she was truly disgusted with herself for what she has done. She has long discarded the story of I wasn't there and I didn't do it. So I think it's high time her followers and her supporters did the same. This brings us to the end of this episode of Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. Please do let me know what you think of the case and the strength of the evidence. This is the first of many episodes, so please make sure to hit that subscribe button and thumbs up the video if you'd like to see more from me in the future. And please feel free to leave me suggestions down below for topics that you would like me to cover in this series. Thank you so much for watching, stay safe, and I will catch you in a future video.